A range of protests and symbolic actions have been held this Friday in Brazil as part of the National Day of Mobilization against President Jair Bolsonaro. Mexico has called on Canada to arrest and extradite Thomas Ceron, the former head of investigations into the 43 disappeared student teachers of Ayatzinapa. Egypt's armed forces have begun large-scale military exercises near the border with Libya in the move seen as a challenge to Turkey. From the headquarters of Teliso English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south and I'm Katrina Goss. Brazil's citizens are carrying out face-to-face -face and symbolic actions in the framework of the National Day of Mobilization against President Jair Bolsonaro. Social and trade union organizations have held meetings in workplaces as well as organizing symbolic events in the streets to reject President Bolsonaro's handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. They also denounce the irresponsibility of the president who insists on promoting the reopening of the economy despite the rising numbers of coronavirus cases in the country. Brazil is the second hardest hit country in the world by COVID-19 and reported almost 10,000 new cases this Friday to bring its total to over 1.7 million. And Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro vetoed the main sections of the bill approved by Congress that would force the government to guarantee the protection of indigenous peoples during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our correspondent Nacho Lemos brings us more details. The Brazilian government's newspaper published the president's veto of 16 items of the draft law 1142 that forces the Brazilian government to guarantee the protection of indigenous communities. That will lead to a higher number of indigenous deaths, a higher number of positive cases. Unfortunately, the Brazilian state did not bring any sufficient or effective measures to combat the COVID-19. That's why the draft law was intended to replace that absence of the state by forcing it to act effectively to ensure the integrity of indigenous people. According to studies by the Federal University of Pelotas, the rate of contagion among indigenous people in the urban population is five times higher than among non-indigenous people, while mortality per COVID-19 among indigenous people is 9.6 percent, for the Brazilian population in general is 5.6 percent. As of July 7, 12,088 indigenous had already been infected by COVID-19 and 445 died. The destruction of indigenous health work that began with the destruction of the mass medical program and other federal government programs for indigenous health, it was already a genocidal practice of Bolsonaro and is deepening with the COVID-19. Bolsonaro vetoed the obligatory quarantines for the distribution of drinking water and hygiene, hospital beds and intensive cares, ventilators and blood oxygenation machines, internet in villages, basic food baskets and easy collections of emergency assistances from the government, taking into account reports by indigenous positive cases in lines to access assistance. Maybe it is the draft law that suffered the most vetoes in the current administration of President Jair Bolsonaro. That draft law must be seen not only as a budgetary economic issue, but as a draft law that saves lives. After Bolsonaro's veto, Supreme Court Minister Luis Barroso determined that the Brazilian government must take urgent measures to prevent the death of indigenous people from coronavirus by installing a situation room with indigenous participation and the National Council for Human Rights. The measure provides isolated or recently contacted indigenous villages and the assistance of indigenous people in demarcated lands, as well as villages without demarcation. 
And turning to Colombia now, where the March for Dignity has arrived in the capital, Bogota, after a fortnight's journey with the aim of denouncing systematic persecution and violence against social leaders, human rights defenders and vulnerable communities. The movement, made up of social leaders, campesinos, indigenous peoples and human rights defenders, arrived in the Colombian capital from Popayán in the department of Cauca. During the march, the protesters voiced complaints from social organizations and victims of violence in each community that made the journey to the capital. Demonstrators also denounced the effects of political, economic and social measures imposed by the Colombian government that openly violate fundamental rights and favor powerful sectors. On our 15th day, this March for Dignity, for Life, for Human Rights, we invite you to this mobilization. I want to say this is a work of all, and that as a regional indigenous council, our companions also waited for us today, and I'm very grateful for this support. They have arrived with their sins to support this mobilization with their different experiences and paths they have taken in this process. Chile's judicial system accepted a lawsuit against President Sebastián Piñera on Thursday for allegedly not having supervised the measures that his health ministry took to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. The complaint was filed by the Chilean Human Rights Commission and other civil society organizations. In a joint statement, the organization stressed that the defendants committed gross negligence and announced that the measures adopted by President Piñera and former health minister Jaime Manuelich have resulted in the deaths of thousands of Chileans as a result of COVID-19. Never again politicians must feel that they are immune to the consequences of their actions and untouchable in the face of their decisions and the power they will. Today, with this lawsuit that will be submitted all over the national territory, the plaintiff will be grouped by province to claim for the death within their province. Once they submit the data, they will be contacted in a reasonable amount of time to explain them the steps that they must follow and how the sponsorship will be delivered to the lawyers, in this case to me, being the attorney in charge of this case. The total number of COVID-19 cases worldwide has now surpassed 12.5 million and almost half of them have been reported in the Americas. The United States is the hardest hit country in the world with over 3.2 million cases and an official death toll of over 136,000. Brazil ranks second with more than 1.7 million cases, having reported almost 43,000 new cases on Thursday. Despite these figures, the presidents of these two countries continue to downplay the risks and push for the reopening of the economy against the recommendations of health experts. On July 10, 1973, the Commonwealth of the Bahamas gained its independence. We take a look back at the events leading up to that date. The island's name is derived from the term Bahamar, or shallow waters, given by Christopher Columbus in 1492, when made landfall in the island of Guanani, occupied by about 40,000 Lucayans at that time. The English first took over the territory in 1625 in an operation carried out by Great Britain to create bases in the New World, from which they could more easily attack the Spanish colonies. In 1898, the Hotel and Steamship Service Act of provided the government support needed for the construction of hotels and subsidized steamship service, which boosted the economy of the islands. On July 10, 1973, the Bahamas became a free and sovereign country, ending 325 years of British rule. Today, the country is a member of the Commonwealth of Nations and joined CARICOM from 1983, ending 325 years of British rule. And we're taking a very short break now, so don't go away. Thomas Saron, the former head of investigations into the Ayotzinapa 43 disappeared student teachers. Foreign Minister Marcelo Ebrard announced the beginning of the process with Canada to ensure the extradition of the former head of the Criminal Investigation Agency, who was one of the officials involved in the case of the 43 student teachers who went missing in September 2014. An Interpol red notice was issued in March for the arrest of Thomas Siron, who fled the country on June 30th. He's accused of having witnessed and tolerated the torture of detainees in the investigation of the Ayotzinapa case. The latest move comes after the remains of one of the missing students was recently identified.
que esos procedimientos estamos iniciando algo similar. Now we are starting something similar in Canada with Thomas Seron. There will be no impunity. Part of our role in the Foreign Affairs Secretariat is to ensure that when there are cases of this nature, extradition occurs. It is something important for Mexican justice that those who have important trials in Mexico or cases in Mexico answer in Mexico for their acts. The unemployment crisis continues in the United States as weekly jobless claims have surpassed 1 million for 16 consecutive weeks. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a huge impact on the US labor market with the worst unemployment rates recorded in March and April. In the third week of June, the total number of people receiving unemployment benefits in the US hit a record high of 32.9 million. According to the data issued by the US Department of Labor on July 2nd, the unemployment rate in June was about 11.1%, still historically high. The U.S. Department of Labor reported Thursday in its weekly report that over 1.3 million new unemployment claims were filed in early July. And the U.S. Supreme Court on Thursday firmly rejected President Donald Trump's arguments on presidential immunity and ruled that a New York prosecutor can obtain his financial records. However, the court prevented, at least for now, committees of the Democratic-led House of Representatives from obtaining similar documents. The twin rulings, authored by Conservative Chief Justice John Roberts, mark another milestone in Trump's chaotic presidency, but in the short term prevent details of his finances from becoming public because lower courts must resolve lingering issues. Uh, from a certain point, I'm um, satisfied. From another point, I'm not satisfied because, frankly, uh, this is a political witch hunt, the likes of which nobody's ever seen before. It's a pure witch hunt. It's a hoax. Just like the Mueller investigation was a hoax that I won, and this is another hoax. This is purely political. So, uh, the Director General of the World Health Organization has announced the launch of the Quitting Tobacco Initiative, which aims to provide access to alternatives and professional advice to help smokers quit. The initiative will be launched in Jordan. Today, WHO is launching the Access Initiative for Quitting Tobacco, which aims to help the world's 1.3 billion tobacco users quit during the pandemic. Smoking kills 8 million people a year. But if users need more motivation to kick the habit, the pandemic provides the right incentive. Evidence reveals that smokers are more vulnerable than non-smokers to developing a severe case of COVID-19. That is why I am beyond pleased that Jordan will be the first country to launch the Access Initiative for Quitting Tobacco. This emphasizes the fact that smoking addiction is a disease that needs to be treated, thus destigmatizing smokers who often feel blamed and shunned for their own addiction. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has warned that the risk of a nuclear war has drastically increased. Lavrov stressed that the global security situation and international strategic stability are deteriorating. The Foreign Minister blamed this situation on US policy, pointing out that the United States is seeking to regain its global dominance as the main world power. In this context, Lavrov stated that during the forthcoming summit of the permanent members of the UN Security Council, Moscow plans to stress that a nuclear war must be avoided. On Friday, spokesperson for the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Xiao Li Shang, stressed that the United States is not qualified to criticize China or the World Health Organization regarding their COVID-19 cooperation, since the country has abandoned its obligations on quitting the WHO. In contrast, the United States has kept jerking its own responsibility of inadequate epidemic response and disregarded the need of international solidarity to fight the pandemic. It not only announced the withdrawal from the World Health Organization, but also politicized the anti-epidemic issue and is keen on in shifting blame to and vilifying others. Now that the U.S. has announced its quit from the WHO, what qualification does it have to point fingers at China WHO cooperation? If the U.S. really cares about the global anti-epidemic, the first thing it should do is to fulfill its due international obligation and commitment and cooperate with the WHO, including inviting its experts to trace the virus origin in the United States. May I ask Mr. Pompeo, can the United States do this?
With millions of candidates pouring out of exam rooms across the country, China's annual National College entrance exam concluded on Friday. The tough test is an essential step for students hoping to secure a place at university to study the course of their choice. More than half of China's provinces officially concluded the exam on Wednesday, but due to the different schedules, other provinces finished the process on Thursday or Friday. East China's Xiangxi province upgraded its emergency response for flood control from level 3 to level 2 on Friday. According to the Provincial Flood Control and Drought Relief Department, continuous rains have increased the water level of the Changxiang River in Poyang County to 3 metres above the warning level to exceed the highest record of 1998. The local government has evacuated and relocated more than 8,000 residents with no casualties reported so far. Local authorities set up warning signs on nearby roads to remind residents of the possible dangers. French President Emmanuel Macron has called on Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to abandon any plans to annex occupied Palestinian territories. Macron stressed such a move would be an act against peace. The French President reminded the Israeli PM of France's commitment to peace in the Middle East and highlighted that such a move would go against international law and would jeopardize the two-state solution as well as a just and lasting peace between Israelis and Palestinians. And we have more stories coming up after this final short break, so stay with us. South. Egypt's armed forces have begun large-scale military exercises near the border with Libya in a move seen as a challenge to Turkey. According to local media, the Egyptian army has been preparing in recent days for the so-called 2020 decisive military exercise near the borders with Libya. The news comes shortly after the Turkish naval force announced its plan to carry out a major exercise off the coast of Libya in the near future. A local television channel reported that all the main branches of the Egyptian armed forces will be involved in these exercises on the western border, which are likely to add to the already tense relations between Egypt and Turkey. Officials in Nepal reported this Friday that 10 people were killed and 30 are missing due to landslides triggered by heavy moonsun rains. The deaths occurred when landslides hit three different spots around the resort town of Bukhara, located 200 kilometers west of the capital. Bukhara is a popular tourist destination and serves as a base for trekkers heading up to mountain trails. Just north of the area, a landslide swept through two villages in Mayagdi district, damaging 37 homes. Roads were also blocked by mudslides, making rescue efforts difficult, while continuing heavy rain prevented helicopter flights. Landslides are common in the Himalayan nation during the monsoon re-season, which begins in June and lasts through September. Demonstrators have staged a sit-in near an oil production site in southeastern Tunisia. Oil production sites are common scenes of recurrent tensions with authorities in Tunisia, with protesters demanding jobs and investment. About 50 people, mostly youngsters, have been conducting a sitting for the past two days near the El Camor oil site, southwest of the capital Tunis, located in the middle of the desert. Demonstrators set up tents and blocked vehicles demanding the implementation of an agreement reached after the clashes of 2017, which provides for the hiring of thousands of unemployed people from this marginalized region and the creation of an investment fund. We have been waiting for the implementation of the El Camor agreement. The government is still in a state of hibernation. We are in El Camur and we will go to the oil valve. We are going near the war soon. Our objective is the valve. Let the government remain in hibernation. It must assume its responsibilities. We have to close the valve and that they don't come begging for it to be open, because this time opening the valve will not be easy. A 33-year-old Palestinian was shot dead by Israeli soldiers in an awful south fit in the central West Bank on Thursday. The Palestinian Health Ministry confirmed the death of Mustafa Abu Yaqub on Thursday night, who was shot by Israeli forces near the main intersection of Kilif Haris town. Health officials stated that the soldiers shot a live round, hitting Mustafa in the neck and causing life-threatening wounds. Palestinian medics rushed the seriously wounded Palestinian to Salfit Governmental Hospital, where he died from his injuries. Israeli soldiers also shot and injured a Palestinian teen with a live round. According to official sources, there were no protests when soldiers opened fire at the victims, who were simply walking near the main entrance of the town. 
South Africa has reported the highest number of coronavirus cases in the continent, despite enforcing a strict lockdown. However, analysts have noted that the high official figures compared to other African nations are likely to be partly due to South Africa's extensive COVID-19 screenings and contact tracing. The average daily number of new cases has risen from 1,000 in May to 8,000 in July. In Gauteng, South Africa's most densely populated province, authorities have recorded more than 80,000 COVID-19 cases, the highest toll in the country. South Africa has now reported over 238,000 cases, but a much smaller death toll of just over 3,700. Zimbabwe reopened Victoria Falls on Tuesday, exactly 100 days after the closure of the UNESCO World Heritage Site due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Tourists now have the opportunity to view the world's largest curtain of falling water. A handful of domestic tourists visited the popular site on its reopening and expressed their joy on once again being able to experience the majestic waterfall. Meanwhile, the director of a local travel agency called Love for Africa urged the government to consider the resumption of intercity travel as the country moves towards the full-scale resumption of tourism activities. And we've come to the end of this news brief, but you can find these and many other stories on our website at tellysoenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Tellysoenglish, I'm Katrina Goss and thank you for watching.